1534 through 1536. A fleeting triumph, political intrigue, and the betrayal of Anne. Part 1. In the previous pages, we have witnessed the process by which a vain, arrogant man, naturally lustful, and held by no moral or material restraint, had been drawn into a position which, when he took the first step that led to it, he could not have contemplated. In ordinary circumstances, there would have been no insuperable difficulty in his obtaining a divorce, and he probably expected little. The divorce, however, in this case, involved the question of a change in the national alliance and a shifting of the weight of England to the side of France, and the emperor, by his power over the pope, had been able to frustrate the design, not entirely on account of his family connection with Catherine, but rather as a question of international policy. The dependent position of the pope had effectually stood in the way of the compromise always sought by France, and the resistance to his will had made Henry the more determined to assert himself, with the natural result that the dispute had developed into religious schism. There is a school of historians which credits Henry personally with the far-reaching design of shaking off the ecclesiastical control of Rome in order to augment the national greatness. But there seems to me little evidence to support the view. When once the king had bearded the papacy, rather than retrace the steps he had taken and confess himself wrong, it was natural that many of his subjects, who conscientiously leant towards greater freedom in religion than Rome would allow, were prepared to carry the lesson further, as the German Lutherans had done. But I can find no reason to believe that Henry desired to initiate any change of system in the direction of freedom, his aim being, as he himself said, simply to make himself pope as well as king within his own realm. Even that position, as we have seen in the aforegoing chapters, was only reached gradually, under the incentive of opposition, and by the aid of stouter hearts and clearer brains than his own. And if Henry could have had his way about the marriage, as he conceivably might have done on many occasions during the struggle, by a very slight change in the circumstances, there would have been, so far as he personally was concerned, no reformation in England at the time. One of the most curious phases in the process here described is the deterioration notable in Henry's character, as the ecclesiastical and moral restraints that influenced him were gradually cast aside. We have seen him as a kind and courteous husband, not more immoral than other men of his age and station, a father whose love for his children was intense, and a cultured gentleman of a headstrong but not unlovable character. Resistance to his will had touched his pride and hardened his heart, until at the period which we have now reached, 1534, we see him capable of brutal and insulting treatment of his wife and elder daughter, of which any gentleman would be ashamed. On the other hand, the attitude of Catherine and Mary was exactly that best calculated to drive to fury a conceited, overbearing man, loving his supreme power as Henry did. It was, of course, heroic and noble of the two ladies to stand upon their undoubted rights as they did. But if Catherine, by adopting a religious life, had consented to a divorce, the degree of nullity would not have been pronounced. Her own position would have been recognized, her daughter's legitimacy saved, and the separation from Rome at least deferred, if not prevented. There was no such deterioration in Anne's character as in that of Henry, for it was bad from the first. 
and consistently remained so. Her ambition was the noblest trait in her nature, and she served it with a petty personal malignity against those who seemed to stand in her way that goes far to deprive her of the pity that otherwise would go out to her in her own martyrdom at the hands of the fleshly tyrant whose evil nature she had been so greatly instrumental in developing it was undoubtedly to anne's prompting that the ungenerous treatment of the princess mary was due a treatment that aroused the indignation even of those to whom its execution was entrusted henry was deeply attached to his daughter but it touched his pride for her to refuse to submit without protest to his behest when norfolk told him of the attitude of the princess on her being taken to hatfield to attend upon elizabeth he decided to bring his parental authority to bear upon her personally and decided to see her but anne quote, considering the easiness or rather levity of the king and that the great beauty and goodness of the princess might overcome his displeasure with her and moved by her virtues and his fatherly pity for her be induced to treat her better and restore her title to her sent cromwell and other messengers posting after the king to prevent him at any cost from seeing or speaking to the princess End quote. when henry arrived at hatfield and saw his baby daughter elizabeth the elder princess begged to be allowed to salute him the request was not granted but when the king mounted his horse in the courtyard mary stood upon a terrace above to see him the king was informed of her presence or saw her by chance and as she caught his eye she threw herself upon her knees in an attitude of prayer whereupon the father touched his bonnet and bowed low and kindly to the daughter he was wronging so bitterly he explained afterwards that he avoided speaking to her as she was so obstinate with him thanks to her spanish blood when the french ambassador mentioned her kindly during the conversation he noted that henry's eyes filled with tears and that he could not refrain from praising her but for anne's jealousy for her own offspring it is probable that mary's legitimacy would have been established by act of parliament as cromwell at this time was certainly in favor of it but anne was ever on the watch especially to arouse henry's anger by hinting that mary was looking to foreigners for counsel as indeed she was it was this latter element in which danger principally lurked catherine naturally appealed to her kin for support and all through her trouble it was this fact joined with her firm refusal to acknowledge henry's supreme power that steeled her husband's heart but for the king's own daughter and undoubted born subject to act in the same way made her what her mother never had been a dangerous center around which the disaffected elements might gather the old nobility as we have seen were against anne and henry quite understood the peril of having in his own family a person who commanded the sympathies of the strongest foreign powers in europe as well as the most influential elements in england he angrily told the marquis of exeter that it was only confidence in the emperor that made mary so obstinate but that he was not afraid of the emperor and would bring the girl to her senses and then he went on to threaten exeter himself if he dared to communicate with her the same course was soon afterwards taken with norfolk who as well as his wife was forbidden to see the princess although he certainly had shown no desire to extend much leniency to her the treatment of catherine was even more atrocious though in her case it was probably more the king's irritated pride than his fears that was the incentive when the wretched elizabeth barton the nun of kent was prosecuted for her crazy prophecies against the king 
every possible effort was made to connect the unfortunate queen with her, though unsuccessfully, and the attempt to force Catherine to take the oath prescribed by the new act of succession against herself and her daughter was obviously a piece of persecution and insult. The commission sent to Buckton to extort the new oath of allegiance to Henry and to Anne as queen consisted of Dr. Lee, the Archbishop of York, Dr. Tunstall, Bishop of Durham, and the Bishop of Chester. And the scene, as described by one of the Spanish servants, is most curious. When the demand was made that she should take the oath of allegiance to Anne as queen, Catherine, with fine scorn, replied, Hold thy peace, bishop, speak to me no more. These are the wiles of the devil. I am queen, and queen will I die. By right the king can have no other wife and let this be your answer. Assembling her household, she addressed them, and told them they could not, without sin, swear allegiance to the king and Anne in a form that would deny the supreme spiritual authority of the Pope, and taking counsel with her Spanish chamberlain, Francisco Felipe, they settled between them that the Spaniards should answer interrogatories in Spanish, in such a way that, by a slight mispronunciation, their answer could be interpreted, quote, I acknowledge that the king has made himself head of the church, end quote. Say hi, acho, cabeza de la iglesia. Whereas the commissioners would take it as meaning, quote, that the king be created head of the church, end quote. Say hi, acho, cabeza de la iglesia. And on the following morning, the wily Chamberlain and his countrymen saved appearances and their consciences at the same time by a pun. But when the formal oath of allegiance to Anne was demanded, Felipe, speaking for the rest, replied, quote, I have taken one oath of allegiance to my lady, Queen Catherine. She still lives, and during her life I know no other queen in this realm. End quote. Lee then threatened them with punishment for refusal, and a bold Burgundian lackey, Bastian, burst out with, quote, Let the king banish us, but let him not order us to be perjurers. End quote. The bishop, in a rage, told him to be gone at once, and, nothing loath, Bastian knelt at his mistress's feet and bade her farewell taking horse at once to ride to the coast. Catherine, in tears, remonstrated with Lee for dismissing her servant without reference to her, and the bishop, now that his anger was calmed, sent messengers to fetch Bastian back, which they did not do until he had reached London. This fresh indignity aroused Catherine's friends, both in England and abroad. The emperor, had already remonstrated with the English ambassador on the reported cruel treatment of the queen and her daughter, and Henry now endeavored to justify himself in a long letter, June 1534. As for the queen, he said, she was being treated, quote, in everything to the best that can be devised, whom we do order and entertain as we think most expedient, and as to us seemeth prudent and the like also of our daughter, the Lady Mary. For we think it not meet that any person should prescribe unto us how we should order our own daughter, we being her natural father. End quote. He expressed himself greatly hurt that the emperor should think him capable of acting unkindly, notwithstanding that the Lady Catherine, quote, hath very disobediently behaved herself towards us, as well as contemning and setting at naught our laws and statutes, as in many other ways. End quote. Just lately, he continues, he had sent three bishops to exhort her, in most loving fashion, to obey the law, and quote, she hath in most ungodly, obstinate, and inobedient wise, willfully resisted, set at naught, and contemned our laws and ordinances, 
So if we would administer to her any rigor or extremity, she were undoubtedly within the extreme danger of our laws. End quote. The blast of persecution swept over the land. The oaths demanded by the new statutes were stubbornly resisted by many. Fisher and Moore, as learned and noble as any men in the land, were sent to the tower, April 1534, to be entrapped and done to death a year later. Throughout the country, the commissioners with plenary powers were sent to administer the new oaths, and those citizens who cavilled at taking them were treated as traitors to the king. But all this did not satisfy Anne, whilst Catherine and Mary remained recalcitrant and unpunished for the same offense. Henry was in dire fear, however, of some action of the emperor in enforcement of the papal excommunication against him and his kingdom, which, according to the Catholic law, he had forfeited by the pope's ban. Francis, willing as he was to oppose the emperor, dared not expose his own kingdom to excommunication by siding with Henry, and the latter was statesman enough to see, as indeed was Cromwell, that extreme measures against Mary would turn all Christendom against him, and probably prove the last unbearable infliction that would drive his own people to aid a foreign invasion. So, Although Anne sneered at the king's weakness, as she called it, and eagerly anticipated his projected visit to Francis, during which she would remain regent in England, and be able to wreak her wicked will on the young princess, the king, held by political fear, and probably, too, by some fatherly regard, refused to be nagged by his wife into the murder of his daughter, and even relinquished the meeting with Francis, rather than leave England with Anne in power. In the meanwhile, Catherine's health grew worse. Henry told the French ambassador in January, soon after Suffolk's attempt to administer the first oath to her, that, quote, she was dropsical and could not live long, end quote. And his enemies were ready with the suggestion, which was probably unfounded, that she was being poisoned. She shut herself up in her own chamber, and refused to eat the food prepared by the new servants, what little food she took being cooked in her own room by her one maid. Early in the summer, May, she was removed from Buckton to Kimbolton Castle, within the miasmic influence of the Fens and there was no attempt to conceal the desire on the part of the king and those who had brought him to this pass that Catherine should die, for by that means alone, it seemed, could foreign intervention and civil war be averted. Catherine herself was, as we have seen, full of suspicion. In March, Chapus reported that she had sent a man to London to procure some old wine for her, as she refused to drink the wine provided for her use. They were trying, he said, to give her artificial dropsy. Two months later, just after the stormy scene when Lee and Tunstall had endeavored to extort from the queen the oath to the new act of succession, Chapus, in hot indignation, suddenly appeared at Richmond, where the king was, to protest against such treatment. Henry was intensely annoyed and offended, and refused to see the ambassador. He was master, he said, in his own realm, and it was no good coming to him with such remonstrances. No wonder that Chapus concluded, quote, Everybody fears some ill turn will be done to the queen, seeing the rudeness to which she is daily subjected, both in deeds and words especially as the concubine has said that she will not cease till she has got rid of her, and as the prophecies say that one queen of England is to be burnt, she hopes it will be Catherine. End quote. Early in June, Catherine urged strongly that Chapus should travel to Kimbolton to see her, alleging the bad condition of her health as a reason. 
the king and Cromwell believed that her true object in desiring an interview was to devise plans with her nephew's ambassador for obtaining the enforcement of the papal censure, which would have meant the subversion of Henry's power, and for weeks Chapus begged for permission to see her in vain. Ladies were not to be trusted, Cromwell told him, whilst fresh commissioners were sent, one after the other, to extort, by force if necessary, the oath of Catherine's lady attendants to the act of succession, much to the queen's distress. At length, tired of waiting, the ambassador told Cromwell that he was determined to start at once, which he did two days later, on the 16th July. With a train of sixty horsemen, his own household and Spaniards resident in England, he rode through London towards the eastern counties, ostensibly on a religious pilgrimage to Our Lady of Walsingham. Riding through the leafy lanes of Hertfordshire in the full summer tide, solaced by music, minstrelsy, and the quaint antics of Chapus's fool, the party were surprised on the second day of their journey to see gallop past them on the road Stephen Vaughan, one of the king's officers who spoke Spanish. And later, when they had arrived within a few miles of Kimbolton, they were met by the same man, accompanied this time by a humble servitor of Catherine, bringing to the pilgrims wine and provisions in abundance, but also the ill news that the king had ordered that Chapus was to be forbidden access to the queen. The ambassador was exceedingly indignant. He did not wish to offend the king, he said, but, having come so far and being now in the immediate neighborhood, he would not return unsuccessful without an effort to obtain a more authoritative decision. Early the next morning, one of Catherine's old officers came to Chapus and repeated the prohibition, begging him not even to pass through the village, lest the king should take it ill. Other messages passed, but all to the same effect. Poor Catherine herself sent secret word that she was as thankful for Chapus's journey as if it had been successful, and hinted that it would be a consolation to her if some of her countrymen could at least approach the castle. Needless to say that the Spaniards gathered beneath the walls of the castle and chatted gallantly across the moat to the ladies upon the terraces, and some indeed, including the jester, are asserted to have found their way inside the castle, where they were regaled heartily, and the fool played some of the usual tricks of his motley. Chapus, in high dungeon, returned by another road to London, without attempting to complete his pilgrimage to Walsingham, secretly spied upon as he was, the whole way by the king's envoy, Vaughan. Tell Cromwell, he said to the latter, as he discovered himself on the outskirts of London, quote, that I should have judged it more honorable if the king and he had informed me of his intention before I left London, so that all the world should not have been acquainted with a proceeding which I refrain from characterizing. But the queen, he continued, nevertheless had cause to thank him, Cromwell, since the rudeness shown to her would now be so patent that it could not well be denied. End quote. Henry and Cromwell had good reason to fear foreign machinations to their detriment. The emperor and Francis were in ominous negotiations, for the king of France could not afford to break with the papacy. The rising of Kildar in Ireland was known to have the sympathy, if not the aid, of Spain, and it was felt throughout Christendom that the emperor must, sooner or later, give force to the papal sentence against England to avoid the utter loss of prestige which would follow if the ban of Rome was, after all, seen to be utterly innocuous. A sympathetic English lord told Chapus secretly that Cromwell had ridiculed the idea of the emperors attacking England, 
for his subjects would not put up with a consequent loss of trade. But if he did, continued Cromwell, quote, the death of Catherine and Mary would put an end to all the trouble, end quote. Chapus told his informant, for Cromwell's behoof, that if any harm was done to either of the ladies, the emperor would have the greater cause for quarrel. In the autumn, Mary fell seriously ill. She had been obliged to follow the bastard Elizabeth, against her will, forever intriguing cleverly to avoid humiliation to herself. But the long struggle against such odds broke down her health, and Henry, who, in his heart of hearts, could hardly condemn his daughter's stubbornness so like his own, softened to the extent of his sending his favorite physician, Dr. Butts, to visit her. A greater concession was to allow Catherine's two medical men to attend the princess, and permission was given to Catherine herself to see her, but under conditions which rendered the concession nugatory. The Queen wrote a pathetic letter in Spanish to Cromwell, praying that Mary might be permitted to come and stay with her. It will half cure her, she urged. As a small boon, Henry had consented that the sick girl should be sent to a house at no great distance from Kimbleton. Alas, urged Catherine, if it be only a mile away I cannot visit her, I beseech that she be allowed to come to where I am. I will answer for her security with my life. But Cromwell or his master was full of suspicion of imperial plots for the escape of Mary to foreign soil, and Catherine's maternal prayer remained unheard. The unhappy mother tried again soon afterwards to obtain access to her sick daughter by means of Chapus. She besought, for charity's sake, that the king would allow her to tend Mary with her own hands. You shall also tell his highness that there is no need for any other person but myself to nurse her. I will put her in my own bed where I sleep, and will watch her when needful. When Chapus saw the king with this pathetic message, Henry was less arrogant than usual. Quote, he wished to do his best for his daughter's health, but he must be careful of his own honor and interests, which would be jeopardized if Mary were conveyed abroad, or if she escaped, as she might easily do if she were with her mother, for he had some suspicion that the emperor had a design to get her away. End quote. Henry threw all the blame for Mary's obstinacy upon Catherine, who he knew was in close and constant touch with his opponents. In the fear he expressed that the emperor and his friends in England would try to spirit Mary across the sea to Flanders, where, indeed, she might have been made a thorn in her father's side, were perfectly well founded, and these plans were at the time the gravest peril that threatened Henry in England. Cruel, therefore, as his actions towards his daughter may seem, it was really prompted by pressing considerations of his own safety. Apart from this desire to keep Mary away from foreign influence working against him through her mother, Henry exhibited frequent signs of tenderness towards his elder daughter, much to Anne's dismay. In May 1534, for instance, he sent her a gentle message to the effect that he hoped she would obey him, and that in such case her position would be preserved. But the girl was proud and, not unnaturally, resentful, and sent back a haughty answer to what she thought was an attempt to entrap her. To her foreign friend, she said, that she believed her father meant to poison her, but that she cared little. She was sure of going to heaven, and was only sorry for her mother. In the meanwhile, Anne's influence over the king was weakening. She saw the gathering clouds from all parts of Christendom ready to launch their lightning upon her head, and ruin upon England for her sake, and her temper, never good, became intolerable. Henry, 
having had his way, was now face to face with the threatening consequences, and could ill brook snappish petulance from the woman for whom he had brought himself to brave the world. As usual with weak men, he pitied himself sincerely, and looked around for comfort, finding none from Anne. Francis, eldest son of the church and most Christian king, was far from being the genial ally he once had been, now that Henry was excommunicate. The German Protestant princes even stood apart and rejected Henry's approaches for an alliance to the detriment of their own suzerain, and, worst of all, the English lords of the north, Hussey, Dacre, and the rest of them, were in close conspiracy with the imperialists for an armed rising aided from abroad, which, if successful, would make short work of Henry and his anti-papal policy. In return for all this danger, the king could only look at the cross, discontented woman by his side, who apparently was as incapable of bearing him a son as Catherine had been. For some months in the spring of 1534, Anne had endeavored to retain her hold upon him by saying that she was again with child, and during the royal progress in the Midland counties in the summer, Henry was more attentive than he had been to the woman he still hoped might bear him a son, although her shrewish temper sorely tried him and all around her. At length, however, the truth had to be told, and Henry's hopes fled, and his eyes again turned elsewhere for solace. Part 2 Anne knew that her position was unstable, and her husband's open flirtation with a lady of the court drove her to fury. Presuming upon her former influence, she imperiously attempted to have her new rival removed from the proximity of the king. Henry flared up at this, and let Anne know, as brutally as language could put it, that the days of his complacence with her were over, and that he regretted having done so much for her sake. Who the king's new lady love was is not certain. Chapus calls her, quote, a very beautiful and adroit young lady, for whom his love is daily increasing, whilst the credit and insolence of the concubine, i.e. Anne, decreases. End quote. That the new favorite was supported by the aristocratic party that opposed Anne and the religious changes is evident from Chapus's remark that, quote, There is some good hope that if this love of the kings continues, the affairs of the queen, Catherine, and the princess will prosper, for the young lady is greatly attached to them. End quote. Anne and her family struggled to keep their footing. But when Henry had once plucked up courage to shake off the trammels, he had all a weak man's violence and obstinacy in following his new course. One of Princess Mary's household came to tell Chapus in October that, quote, the king had turned Lady Rockford, and sister-in-law, out of the court because she had conspired with the concubine, by hook or by crook, to get rid of the young lady. End quote. The rise of the new favorite immediately changed the attitude of the courtiers towards Mary. Quote, On Wednesday before leaving the moor, she, Mary, was visited by all the ladies and gentlemen, regardless of the annoyance of Anne. The day before yesterday, October 22nd, the princess was at Richmond with the brat, Garce, i.e. Elizabeth, and the lady, Anne came to see her daughter accompanied by the dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk and others, all of whom went and saluted the princess, Mary, with some of the ladies, which was quite a new thing. End quote. The death of Pope Clement and the advent of Cardinal Farnese as Paul the Third, known to be not too well affected towards the emperor, seemed at this time to offer 
a chance of the reconciliation of england with the papacy and the aristocratic party in henry's councils hoped now that the king had grown tired of his second wife that they might influence him by a fresh appeal to his sensuality france also took a hand in the game in its new aspect the aim being to obtain the hand of mary for the dauphin to whom it will be recollected she had been betrothed as a child with the legitimization of the princess and the return of henry to the fold of the church with a french alliance this would of course have involved the repudiation of anne with the probable final result of a french domination of england after the king's death the admiral of france chabot de Bion, came to england late in the autumn to forward some such arrangement as that described and incidentally to keep alive henry's distrust of the emperor whilst threatening him that the dauphin would marry a spanish princess if the king of england held aloof but though anne's influence over her husband was gone cromwell the strong spirit was still by his side and reconciliation with the papacy in any form would have meant ruin to him and the growing interests that he represented even if henry had now been inclined to yield to the papacy of which there is no evidence cromwell had gone too far to recede and when parliament met in november the act of supremacy was passed giving the force of statute law to the independence of the church of england chabot de brion's mission was therefore doomed to failure from the first and the envoy took no pains to conceal his resentment towards anne the origin of all the trouble that dislocated the european balance of power there was much hollow feasting and insincere professions of friendship between the two kings but it was clear now to the frenchman that with anne or without her henry would bow his neck no more to the papacy and it was to the princess mary that the catholic elements looked for a future restoration of the old state of things a grand ball was given at court in chabot's honor the day before he left london and the dignified french envoy sat in a seat of state by the side of anne looking at the dancing suddenly without apparent reason she burst into a violent fit of laughter the admiral of france already in no very amiable mood frowned angrily and turning to her said are you laughing at me madame or what after she had laughed to her heart's content she excused herself to him by saying that she was laughing because the king had told her that he was going to fetch the admiral's secretary to be introduced to her and on the way the king had met a lady who had made him forget everything else though henry would not submit to the papacy at the charming of francis he was loath to forego the french alliance and proposed a marriage between the younger french prince the duke of angoulême and elizabeth and this was under discussion during the early months of fifteen thirty five but it is clear that although the daughter of the second marriage was to be held legitimate anne was to gain no accession of strength by the new alliance for the french flouted her almost openly and henry was already contemplating a divorce from her we are told by chapus that he only desisted from the idea when a counsellor told him that quote, if he separated from the concubine he would have to recognize the validity of his first marriage and worst of all submit to the pope End quote. who the counsellor was that gave this advice is not stated but we may fairly assume that it was cromwell who soon found a shorter and for him a safer way of ridding his master of a wife who had tired him and could bear him no son a french alliance with a possible reconciliation with rome in some form would not have suited cromwell for it would have meant a triumph for the aristocratic party at henry's court 
in the overthrow of the men who had led Henry to defy the papacy. If the aristocratic party could influence Henry by means of the nameless new young lady, the Bolins and reformers could fight with the same weapons, and early in February 1535 we find Chapus writing, quote, The young lady formerly in the king's good graces is so no longer, and has been succeeded by a cousin German of the concubine, the daughter of the present governess of the princess. End quote. This new mistress, whilst her little reign lasted, worked well for Anne and Cromwell. But in the meantime, the conspiracy amongst the nobles grew and strengthened. Throughout the upper classes in the country, a feeling of deep resentment was felt at the treatment of Mary, and there was hardly a nobleman, except Anne's father and brother, who was not pledged to take up arms in her cause and against the religious changes. Cromwell's answer to the disaffection, of which he was quite cognizant, was the closer keeping than ever of the royal ladies, with threats of their death, if they were the cause of a revolt, and the stern enforcement of the oath prescribed by the Act of Supremacy. The martyrdom of the London Carthusians for refusing to take the oath of supremacy, and shortly afterwards, the sacrifice of the venerable Bishop Fisher, Sir Thomas More, and Catherine's priest, Abel, and the renewed severity towards her favorite confessor, Friar Forrest, soon also to be martyred with atrocious cruelty, shocked and horrified England and aroused the strongest reprobation in france and rome as well as in the dominions of the emperor destroying for a time all hope of a french alliance and any lingering chance of a reconciliation with rome during henry's life all catholic aspirations both at home and abroad centered for the next year or so in the princess mary and her father's friendship was shunned even by francis except upon impossible conditions. Henry's throne, indeed, was tottering. His country was riddled with disaffection and dislike of his proceedings. The new pope had forged the final thunderbolt of Rome, enjoining all Christian potentates to execute the sentence of the church, though as yet the fiat was held back at the instance of the emperor. The dread of war and the general unrest arising from this state of things had well-nigh destroyed the English oversea trade. The harvest was a bad one, and food was dear. Ecclesiastics throughout the country were whispering to their flocks curses of Nan Bullen, for whose sake the Church of Christ was being split in twain and its ministers persecuted. And, it is true, was now quite a secondary personage as a political factor, but upon her unpopular head was heaped the blame for everything. The wretched woman, fully conscious that she was the general scapegoat, could only pray for a son, whose advent might save her at the eleventh hour. For failing him, she knew that she was doomed. In the meanwhile, the struggle was breaking Catherine's heart. For seven years she had fought as hard against her fate as an outraged woman could. She had seen that her rights, her happiness, were only a small stake in the game of European politics. To her it seemed but righteous that her nephew, the emperor, should, at any cost, rise in indignant wrath and avenge the insult put upon his proud line, and upon the papacy, whose earthly champion he was, by crushing the forces that had wrought the wrong. But Charles was held back by all sorts of considerations arising from his political position. Francis was forever on the lookout for a weak spot in the imperial armor. The German Protestant princes, although quite out of sympathy with Henry's matrimonial vagaries, would look askance at a crusade to enforce the Pope's executorial decree against England. The French and moderate influence in the College of Cardinals was strong, and Charles 
could not afford by too aggressive an action against henry to drive francis and the cardinals into closer union against imperial aims especially in the mediterranean and italy where owing to the vacancy in the duchy of milan they now mainly centred so catherine clamoured in vain to those whose sacred duty she thought it was to vindicate her honour and the faith both she and her daughter at her instigation wrote burning letters to the pope and the imperial agents urging beseeching exhorting the catholic powers to activity against their oppressor henry and cromwell knew all this and recognizing the dire danger that sooner or later catherine's prayer to a united christendom might launch upon england an avalanche of ruin strove as best they might to avert such a catastrophe every courier who went to the emperor from england carried alarmist rumors that catherine and mary were to be put out of the way and the ladies in a true spirit of martyrdom awaited without flinching the hour of their sacrifice cromwell himself darkly hinted that the only way out of the maze of difficulty and peril was the death of catherine and in this he was apparently right but at this distance of time it seems evident that much of the threatening talk both of the king's friends and those of the catholic church in england was intended on the one hand to drive catherine and her daughter into submission and prevent them from continuing their appeals for foreign aid and on the other to move the emperor to action against henry so in the welter of political interests catherine wept and raged fruitlessly the papal decree directing the execution of the deprivation of henry though signed by the pope was still held back for charles could not afford to invade england himself and was determined to give no excuse for francis to do so though there is no known ground for the then prevailing belief that henry was aiding nature in hastening the death of his first wife the long unequal combat against invincible circumstances was doing its work upon a constitution never robust and by the late autumn of fifteen thirty five the stout-hearted daughter of isabel the catholic was known to be sick beyond surgery in december fifteen thirty five chapus had business with cromwell and during the course of their conversation the latter told him that he had just sent a messenger to inform the king of catherine's serious illness this was the first that chapus had heard of it and he at once requested leave to go and see her to which cromwell replied that he might send a servant to inquire as to her condition but that the king must be consulted before he chapus himself could be allowed to see her as chapus was leaving whitehall a letter was brought to him from catherine's physician saying that the queen's illness was not serious and would pass off so that unless later unfavorable news was sent chapus need not press for leave to see her two days afterwards a letter reached him from catherine herself enclosing one to the emperor she wrote in the deepest depression praying again and for the hundredth time in words that as chapu says quote, would move a stone to compassion end quote, that prompt action should be taken on behalf of herself and her daughter before the parliament could do them to death and consummate the apostasy of england it was her last heartbroken cry for help and like all those that had preceded it during the seven bitter years of catherine's penance it was unheard amidst the din of great national interests that was ringing through europe it was during the feast of christmas fifteen thirty five which henry passed at eltham that news came to chapus from de la salle that catherine had relapsed and was in grave peril the ambassador was to see the king on other business in a day or two in any case but this news caused him to beg cromwell to obtain for him instant leave to go to the queen 
there would be no difficulty about it the secretary replied but chapus must see the king first at greenwich whither he would go to meet him the ambassador found henry in the tilt yard all amiability with a good deal of overdone cordiality the king walked up and down the lists arm in arm with chapus the while he reverted to the proposal of a new friendship and alliance with the emperor the french he said were up to their old pranks especially since the duke of milan had died but he should at last be forced into an intimate alliance with them unless the emperor would let bygones be bygones and make friends with him chapus was cool and non-committal he feared he said that it was only a device to make the french jealous and after much word bandying between them the ambassador flatly asked henry what he wanted the emperor to do i want him replied the king not only to cease to support madame catherine and my daughter but also to get the papal sentence in madame's favor revoked to this chapus replied that he saw no good reason for doing either and had no authority to discuss the point raised and as a parting shot henry told him that catherine could not live long and when she died the emperor would have no need to follow the matter up when chapus had taken his leave the duke of suffolk came after him and brought him back to the king who told him that news had just reached him that catherine was dying chapus might go and see her but he would hardly find her alive her death moreover would do away with all cause for dissension between the emperor and himself a request that the princess mary might be allowed to see her dying mother was at first met with a flat refusal and after chapus's remonstrance by a temporizing evasion which was as bad so that mary saw her mother no more in life chapus instantly took horse and sped to london and then northward to kimbleton anxious to reach the queen before she breathed her last for he was told that for days the patient had eaten and drank nothing and slept hardly at all it took chapus two days of hard travel over the miry roads before he reached kimbleton on the morning of the second january fifteen thirty six he found that the queen's dearest friend lady willoughby dona maria de sarmiento had preceded him by a day and was with her mistress she had prayed in vain for license to come before and even now catherine's stern guardian bedingfield asked in vain to see lady willoughby's permit which she probably had not got she had come in great agitation and fear for according to her own account she had fallen from her horse and had suffered other adventures on her way but she braved everything to receive the last sigh of the queen whose girlhood's friend she had been bedingfield looked askance at the arrival of these folks and at chapus's first interview with catherine he the chamberlain and vaughan who understood spanish were present and listened to all that was said it was a consolation said the queen that if she could not recover she might die in the presence of her nephew's ambassador and not unprepared he tried to cheer her with encouraging promises that the king would let her be removed to another house and would accede to other requests made in her favor but catherine only smiled sadly and bade him rest after his long journey she saw the ambassador again alone later in the day and spoke at length with him as she did on each day of the four that he stayed her principal discourse being of the misfortune that had overtaken england by reason of the long delay of the emperor in enforcing justice to her after four days's stay of chapus catherine seemed better and the apothecary de la Salle, gave it as his opinion that she was out of immediate danger 
she even laughed a little at the antics of chapus's fool who was called in to amuse her and reassured by the apparent improvement the ambassador started on his leisurely return to london on the second day after his departure soon after midnight the queen asked if it was near day and repeated the question several times at short intervals afterwards when at length the watchers asked her the reason for her impatience for the dawn she replied that it was because she wished to hear mass and receive the holy sacrament the aged dominican bishop of landoff jorge diateca volunteered to celebrate at four o'clock in the morning but catherine refused and quoted the latin authorities to prove that it should not be done before dawn with the first struggling of the gray light of morning the offices of the church for the dying were solemnly performed whilst catherine prayed fervently for herself for england and for the man who had so cruelly wronged her when all was done but the administration of extreme unction she bade her physician write a short memorandum of a few gifts she craved for her faithful servants for she knew and said that by the law of england a married woman could make no valid will the testament is in the form of a supplication to henry and is remarkable as the dictation of a woman within a few hours of her death each of her servants is remembered a hundred pounds to her principal spanish lady blanche de vargas twenty pounds to mistress darrell for her marriage his wages and forty pounds were to be paid to francisco felipe the groom of the chambers twenty pounds to each of the three lackeys including the burgundian bastion and like bequests one by one to each of the little household not even the sum she owed for a gown was forgotten for her daughter she craved her furs and the gold chain and cross she had brought from spain all that was left of her treasures after anne's greed had been satisfied and for the convent of observant franciscans where she begged for shepulcher quote, my gowns which he the king holdeth end quote it is a sad little document compliance with which was for the most part meanly evaded by henry even francisco felipe quote, getting nothing and returning poor to his own country end quote. thus dignified and saintly at the second hour after midday on the eighth january fifteen thirty six catherine of aragon died unconquered as she had lived a great lady to the last sacrificed in death as she had been in life to the opportunism of high politics in manos tuas domine commendo spiritum meum she murmured with her last breath from man she had received no mercy and she turned to a gentler judge with confidence and hope as usual in such cases as hers the people about her whispered of poison and when the body was hastily seared and lapped in lead quote, by the candle-maker of the house a servant and one companion end quote, not even the queen's physician was allowed to be present but the despised candle-maker who really seems to have been a skilled embalmer secretly told the bishop of landoff who waited at the door that all the body was sound except the heart which was black and hideous with a black excrescence which clung closely to the outside on which report dr de la saw unhesitatingly opined that his mistress had died of poison the news the joyous news sped quickly to greenwich and within four and twenty hours on saturday ninth january henry heard with exultation that the incubus was raised from his shoulders god be praised was his first exclamation we are free from all suspicion of war <laughs> 
Now, he continued, he would be able to manage the French better. They would be obliged to dance to his tune, for fear he should join the emperor, which would be easy now that the cause for disagreement had gone. Thus, heartlessly and haggling meanly over his wife's little bequests, even that to her daughter, Henry greeted the death of the woman he once had seemed to love. He snivelled a little when he read the affecting letter to him that she had dictated in her last hour, but the word went forth that on the next day, Sunday, the court should be at its gayest, and Henry and Anne, in gala garb of yellow finery, went to mass with their child, in full state to the sound of trumpets. After dinner the king could not restrain his joy, even within the bounds of decency. Entering the hall in which the ladies were dancing, he pirouetted about in the exuberance of his heart, and then, calling for his fair little daughter Elizabeth, he proudly carried her in his arms from one courtier to another to be petted and praised. There was only one drop of gall in the cup for the Bolins, and they made no secret of it, namely, that the Princess Mary had not gone to accompany her mother. If Anne had only known it, her last chance of keeping at the king's side as his wife was the survival of Catherine, and lamentation, instead of rejoicing, should have been her greeting of the news of her rival's death. Henry, in fact, was tired of Anne already and the cabal of nobles against her, and the religious system she represented, was stronger than ever. But the repudiation of his second wife on any excuse during the life of the first would have necessitated the return of Catherine as the king's lawful spouse, with all the consequences that such a change would entail. And this Henry's pride, as well as his inclinations, would never permit now that Catherine was dead, Anne was doomed to speedy ruin by one instrumentality or another, and before many weeks the cruel truth came home to her. Catherine was buried, not in such a convent as she had wished, for Henry said there was not one in England, but in Peterborough Cathedral, within fifteen miles of Kimbleton. The honors paid to her corpse were those of a dowager princess of Wales. But the country folk, who bordered the miry tracks through which the procession ploughed, paid to the dead Catherine in her funeral litter the honours they had paid her in her life. Parliament, far away in London, might order them to swear allegiance to Nan Bullen as queen, and to her daughter as heiress of England. King Harry, on his throne, might threaten them as he did with stake and gibbet if they dared to disobey but though they bowed the head and mumbled such oaths as were dictated to them catherine to them had always been queen consort of england and mary her daughter was no bastard but true princess of wales whatever king and parliament might say Part three. All people and all interests were, as if instinctively, shrinking away from Anne. Her uncle Norfolk had quarrelled with her and retired from court. The French were now almost as inimical as the imperialists, and even the time-serving courtiers turned from the waning favourite. She was no longer young, and her ill temper and many anxieties had marred her good looks. Her gaiety and lightness of manner had to a great extent fled, and sedate occupations, reading, needlework, charity, and devotion, occupied most of her time. Oh, for a son! was all the unhappy woman could sigh in her misery, for that, she knew, was the only thing that could save her now that Catherine was dead, and Anne might be repudiated by her husband, without the need for taking back his first discarded wife. Hope existed again, 
that the prayed-for son might come into the world, and at the first prospect of it, Anne made an attempt to utilize the influence it gave her by cajoling or crushing Mary into submission to the king's will. The girl was desolate at her mother's death, but she had her mother's proud spirit, and her answers to Anne's approaches were as cold and haughty as before. Quote, the concubine, writes Chapus, 21st January, 1536, has thrown out the first bait to the princess, telling her by her aunt, Lady Shelton, that if she would discontinue her obstinacy and obey her father like a good girl, she, Anne, will be the best friend in the world to her, and, like another mother, will try to obtain for her all she wants. If she will come to court, she shall be exempt from carrying her, Anne's, train, and shall always walk by her side. End quote. But obedience meant that Mary should recognize Cranmer's sentence against her mother, the repudiation of the papal authority, and her own illegitimacy, and she refused the olive branch held out to her. Then Anne changed her tone, and wrote to her aunt a letter to be put into Mary's way, threatening the princess. In her former approaches, she said, she had only desired to save Mary out of charity. It was no affair of hers. She did not care. But when she had the son she expected, the king would show no mercy to his rebellious daughter. But Mary remained unmoved. She knew that all Catholic Europe looked upon her now as the sole heiress of England, and that the emperor was busy planning her escape in order that she might, from the safe refuge of his dominions, be used as the main instrument for the submission of England to the papacy and the destruction of Henry's rule. For things had turned out somewhat differently in this respect from what the king had expected. The death of Catherine, very far from making the armed intervention of Charles in England more improbable, had brought it sensibly nearer for the great war-storm that had long been looming between the French and Spaniards in Italy, was now about to burst. Francis could no longer afford to alienate the papacy by even pretending to a friendship with the excommunicated Henry, whilst England might be paralyzed. And all chance of a diversion against imperial arms in favor of France averted, by the slight aid and subsidy by the emperor, of a Catholic rising in England against Henry and Anne. On the 29th January, 1536, Anne's last hope was crushed. In the fourth month of her pregnancy, she had a miscarriage, which she attributed passionately to her love for the king and her pain at seeing him flirting with another woman. Henry showed his rage and disappointment brutally, as was now his wont. He had hardly spoken to Anne for weeks before, and when he visited her at her bedside, he said that it was quite evident that God meant to deny him heirs male by her. When you get up, he growled in answer to the poor woman's complaints as he left her, I will talk to you. The lady of whom Anne was jealous was probably the same that had attracted the king at the ball given to the Admiral of France two months previously, and had made him, as Anne hysterically complained, quote, forget everything else, end quote. This lady was Mistress Jane Seymour, a daughter of Sir John Seymour, of Wolf Hall, Wilts. She was, at the time, just over twenty-five years of age, and had been at court for some time as a maid of honor to Catherine, and afterwards to Anne. During the king's progress in the autumn of 1535, he had visited Wolf Hall, where the daughter of the house had attracted his admiring attention, apparently for the first time. Jane is described as possessing no great beauty, being somewhat colorless as to complexion, but her demeanor was sweet and gracious, and the king's admiration for her at once marked her out 
as a fit instrument for the conservative party of nobles at court to use against Anne and the political and religious policy which she represented. Apparently Jane had no ability, and none was needed in the circumstances. Chapus, moreover, suggests, with unnecessary spite, that in morals she was no better than she should have been, on the unconvincing grounds that, quote, being an Englishwoman, and having been so long at court, whether she would not hold it a sin to still be a maid. End quote. Her supposed unchastity, indeed, is represented as being an attraction to Henry, quote, for he may marry her on condition that she is a maid, and when he wants a divorce, there will be plenty of witnesses ready to testify that she was not. End quote. This, however, is mere detraction by a man who firmly believed that the cruelly wronged Catherine, whose cause he served, had just been murdered by Henry's orders. That Jane had no strength of character is plain, and throughout her short reign she was merely an instrument by which politicians sought to turn the king's passion for her to their own ends. The Seymours were a family of good descent, allied with some of the great historic houses, and Jane's two brothers, Edward and Thomas, were already handsome and notable figures at Henry's court, the elder, Sir Edward Seymour, especially, having accompanied the showy visits of the Duke of Suffolk, Cardinal Wolsey, and the king himself to France. So far as can be ascertained, however, the brothers, prompt as they were to profit by their sister's elevation, were no parties to the political intrigue of which Jane was probably the unconscious tool. She was carefully indoctrinated by Anne's enemies, especially Sir Nicholas Carew, how she was to behave. She must, above all, profess great devotion and friendship to the Princess Mary, to assume a mean of rigid virtue and high principles which would be likely to pique a sensual man like Henry without gratifying his passion except by marriage. Many of the enemies of the French connection, which included the great majority of the nation, looked with hope towards the king's new infatuation as a means of luring back England to the comity of Catholic nations and friendship with the emperor, though there was still a section, especially in the north of England, which believed that their best interests would be served by an open rebellion in the interests of Mary, supported from Flanders by her cousin, the Emperor. All this was, of course, well known to Cromwell. He had been one of the first to counsel defiance of the Pope, but throughout he had been anxious to avoid an open quarrel with the Emperor, or to pledge England too closely to French interests, and now that even the French had turned against Anne, Cromwell saw that, unless he himself was to be dragged down when she fell, he must put the brake hard down upon the religious policy that he had initiated, and make common cause with Anne's enemies. In a secret conference that he held with Chapus at the Austin Friars, which in future was to be his own mansion, Cromwell proposed a new alliance between England and the Emperor, which would necessarily have to be accompanied by some compromise with the Pope and the recognition of Mary's legitimacy. He assured the imperial ambassador that Norfolk, Suffolk, and the rest of the nobles formerly attached to France were of the same opinion as himself, and tried earnestly to convince his interlocutor that he had no sympathy with Anne, whom he was ready to throw overboard to save himself. When Charles received this news from his ambassador, he took a somewhat tortuous but characteristic course. He was willing, to a great extent, to let bygones be bygones, and to forget the sufferings, and perhaps the murder, of his aunt Catherine, if Henry would come to terms with the papacy and legitimize the Princess Mary. But, curiously enough, 
He preferred that Anne should remain at Henry's side, instead of being repudiated. Her marriage, he reasoned, was obviously invalid, and any children she might have by Henry would consequently be unable to interfere with Mary's rights to the succession, whereas if Henry were to divorce Anne and contract a legal marriage, any son born to him would disinherit Mary. To this extent was Charles ready to descend, if he could obtain English help and money in the coming war, and Cromwell, at all events, was anxious to go quite as far to meet him. He now showed ostentatious respect to the Princess Mary, restoring to her the little gold cross that had been her mother's, and of which she had been cruelly deprived. Condemned openly, the continued execution of his own policy of spoliation of the monasteries, and quarreled both with Anne and the only man now in the same boat with her, Archbishop Cranmer, who trembled in his shoes at the ruin he saw impending upon his patroness, ready at any moment to turn his coat, but ignorant of how to do it. For Cranmer, however able a casuist he might be, possessed little statesmanship and less courage. Lady Exeter was the go-between, who brought the imperial ambassador into the conspiracy to oust Anne. The time was seen to be ripening. Henry was already talking in secret about, quote, his having been seduced into the marriage with Anne by sorcery, and consequently that he considered it to be null, which was clearly seen by God's denying a son. He thought he should be quite justified in taking another wife, end quote. And Jane Seymour's company seemed daily more necessary to his comfort. Sir Edward Seymour was made a gentleman of the privy chamber early in March, and a fortnight later the Marchioness of Exeter reported to her friend Chapus that the king, who was at Whitehall, had sent a loving letter and a purse of gold to his new lady love. The latter had been carefully schooled as to the wise course to pursue, and played pewtery to perfection. She kissed the royal letter fervently without opening it, and then, throwing herself upon her knees, besought the messenger to pray the king in her name to consider that she was a gentlewoman of fair and honorable lineage, and without reproach. Quote, she had nothing in the world but her honor, which for a thousand deaths she would not wound. If the king deigned to make her a present of money, she prayed it might be when she made an honorable marriage. End quote. According to Lady Exeter's report, this answer inflamed even more the king's love for Jane. Quote, she had behaved herself in the matter very modestly, he said and in order to let it be seen that his intentions and affection were honorable, he intended future only to speak to her in the presence of some of her relatives. End quote. Cromwell, moreover, was turned out of a convenient apartment to which secret access could be obtained from the king's quarters, in order that Sir Edward Seymour, now Viscount Beauchamp, and his wife should be lodged there and facility thus given for the king's virtuous billing and cooing with Jane, whilst saving the proprieties. When it was too late, even Anne attempted to desert her own political party and to rally to the side of the emperor, whether because she understood the indulgent way in which the latter now regarded her union with Henry, or whether from mere desperation at the ruin impending, it is not easy to say, but the conspiracy for her destruction had already gone too far when the emperor's diplomatic instructions came to his ambassador. It was understood now at court that the king intended somehow to get rid of his doubtful wife and marry another woman, and Cromwell, with a hypocritical smile behind his hand, whispered to Chapus that though the king might divorce Anne, he would live more virtuously in the future. 
when the imperial ambassador with his master's friendly replies to henry's advances saw the king at greenwich on the eighteenth april fifteen thirty six the court was all smiles for him and anne desperately clutched at the chance of making friends with him chapus was cool and declined to go and salute her as he was invited to do he was ready as he said to hold a candle to the devil or a hundred of them if his master's interests would thereby be served but he knew that anne was doomed and notwithstanding his master's permission he made no attempt to conciliate her all the courtiers were watching to see how he would treat her on this the first occasion that they had met since catherine's death as anne passed into the chapel to high mass she looked eagerly around to greet her enemy where was he in the chapel she knew and to sit close by her side but he was nowhere to be seen he was in fact standing behind the open door by which she entered but determined not to be balked she turned completely round and made him a profound curtsy which as he was bound to do he returned in anne's rooms afterwards where the king and the other ambassadors dined chapus was not present much to the concubine's chagrin but the princess mary and her friends in the conspiracy were suspicious and jealous even of the bow that had been exchanged under such adverse circumstances in the chapel anne at dinner coarsely abused the king of france and strove her utmost to lead people to think that she too was hand in glove with the imperialists as her enemies were whilst henry was graciousness itself to chapus until he came to close quarters and heard that the emperor was determined to drive a hard bargain and force his english uncle to eat a large piece of humble pie before he could be taken to his bosom again then henry hectored and vaunted like the bully that he was and upon cromwell fell his ill humor for having as henry thought been too pliant with the imperialists and for the next week cromwell was ill and in disgrace submission to the pope to the extent that charles demanded was almost impossible now both in consequence of henry's own vanity and because the vast revenues and estates of the monasteries had in many cases replenished the king's exchequer or had endowed his nobles and favorites catholics though many of them were a surrender of these estates and revenues would have been resisted even if such had been possible to the death by those who had profited by the spoliation and unless the pope and the emperor were willing to forget much the hope of reconciling england with the church was an impossible dream the great nobles who had battened upon the spoils especially norfolk themselves took fright at the emperor's uncompromising demands and tried to play off france against charles during cromwell's short disgrace the secretary saw that if the friends of france once more obtained the control over henry's fickle mind the revolutionary section of the catholic party in favor of mary and the imperial connection would carry all before them and that in the flood of change cromwell and all his works would certainly be swept away if anne could be got rid of and the king married to mistress seymour jointly with the adoption of a moderate policy of compromise with rome and the emperor all might be well and cromwell might retain the helm but either an uncompromising persistence in the open protestant defiance with probably a french alliance against the emperor or on the other hand an armed catholic revolution in england subsidized from flanders would have been inevitable ruin to cromwell and then must be destroyed at any cost and the king be won to the side of the man who would devise a means of doing it but how a repudiation or formal divorce on the ground of invalidity 
would, of course, have been easy, but it would have been too scandalous. It would also have convicted the king of levity, and above all, have bastardized his second daughter, leaving him with no child that the law of the realm regarded as legitimate. Henry himself, as we have seen, talked about his having been drawn into the marriage by sorcery, and ardently desired to get rid of his wife. His intercourse with Jane Seymour, who was being cleverly coached by Anne's enemies and Mary's friends, plainly indicated that marriage was intended, but it was the intriguing brain of Cromwell that devised the only satisfactory way in which the king's caprice and his own interests could be served in the treatment of Anne. Appearances must, at any cost, be saved for Henry. He must not appear to blame whatever happened. Cromwell must be able, for his own safety, to drag down Anne's family and friends at the same time that she was ruined, and the affair must be so managed that some sort of reconciliation could be patched up with the emperor, whilst Norfolk and the French adherents were thrust into the background. Cromwell pondered well on the problem as he lay in bed, sick with annoyance at Henry's rough answer to the emperor's terms, and thus he hit upon the scheme that alone would serve the aims he had in view. The idea gave him health and boldness again, and just as Henry, under Norfolk's influence, was smiling upon the French ambassador, Cromwell appeared once more before his master after his five days' absence. What passed at their interview can only be guessed by the light of the events that followed. It is quite possible that Cromwell did not tell the king of his designs against Anne, but only that he had discovered a practice of treason against him. But whether the actual words were pronounced or not, Henry must have understood. Before he signed and gave to Cromwell, the secret instrument demanded of him. That evil was intended to the woman of whom he had grown tired. It was a patent, dated the 24th April, appointing the Lord Chancellor Audley and a number of nobles, including the Duke of Norfolk and Anne's father, the Earl of Wiltshire, together with the judges, a commission to inquire into any intended treasonable action, no matter by whom committed, and to hold a special court to try the persons accused. With this instrument in his pocket, Cromwell held at will the lives of those whom he sought to destroy. Anne, as we have seen, had loved and courted the admiration of men, even as her daughter Elizabeth afterwards did, to an extent that bordered upon mania. Her manners were free and somewhat hysterical, and her reputation before marriage had been more than doubtful. But the stern act of succession, which in 1534 made it treason to question the legitimacy of Anne's daughter, barred all accusations against her except in respect to actions after Elizabeth's birth. Cromwell was well served by spies, even in Anne's chamber, for her star was visibly paling and people feared her vengeance little, and not many days passed before the secretary had in his hand testimony enough to strike the first blow. It was little enough according to our present notions of evidence, and at another time would have passed unnoticed. A young fellow of humble origin, named Mark Smeaton, had, by Anne's influence, been appointed one of Henry's grooms of the chamber in consequence of his skill as a lute player. Anne herself, who was a fine musician and composer, delighted in listening to Mark's performances, and doubtless, as was her wont, she challenged his admiration because he was a man. A contemporary who repeated the tattle of the court says that she had fallen in love with the lute player and had told him so.
and that she had aroused the jealousy of her rival admirers, Norris, Brereton, and others, by her lavish gifts and open favor to Mark Smeaton. According to this story, she endeavored to appease the former by renewed flirting with them, and to silence Mark's discontent by large gifts of money. Others of her courtiers, especially Sir Thomas Percy, indignant that an upstart like Mark should be treated better than themselves, insulted and picked quarrels with the musician. And it is evident that Anne, at the very time that Cromwell was spreading his nets for her, was hard put to it to keep the peace between a number of idle, jealous young men, whose admiration she had sought for pastime. On the 29th April, Mark Smeaton was standing sulkily in the deep embrasure of a window in Anne's chamber in the palace of Greenwich. The queen asked him why he was so out of humor. He replied that it was nothing that mattered. She evidently knew the real reason for his gloom, for she reminded him that he could not expect her to speak to him as if he were a nobleman. No, no, said Mark. A look suffices for me, and so fare you well. Sir Thomas Percy seems to have heard this little speech, and have conveyed it, with many hints of Mark's sudden prosperity, to Cromwell. It is hardly three months since Mark came to court, and though he is only a hundred pounds a year from the king, and has received no more than a third, he has just bought three horses that have cost him five hundred ducats as well as very rich arms and fine liveries for his servants for the May-day ridings, such as no gentleman at court has been able to buy, and many are wondering where he gets the money. Mark Smeaton was a safe quarry, for he had no influential friends, and it suited Cromwell's turn to begin with him to build up his case against Anne. Part 4 There was to be a May Day jousting in the tilt yard at Greenwich, at which Anne's brother, Lord Rochford, was the challenger, and Sir Henry Norris was the principal defender. Early in the morning of the day, Cromwell, who of course took no part in such shows, went to London and asked Smeaton to accompany him and dine returning in the afternoon to Greenwich in time for the writings. Mark accepted the invitation, and was taken, ostensibly, for dinner to a house at Stepney, that, probably being a convenient halfway place between Greenwich and Westminster by water. No sooner had the unsuspecting youth entered the chamber than he saw the trap into which he had fallen. Six armed men closed around him, and Cromwell's face grew grave, as the secretary warned the terrified lad to confess where he had obtained so much money. Smeaton prevaricated, and, quote, Then two stout young fellows were called, and the secretary asked for a rope and cudgel. The rope, which was filled with knots, was put around Mark's head and twisted with the cudgel until Mark cried, Sir, secretary, no more. I will tell the truth. The queen gave me the money. End quote. Then, bit by bit, by threats of torture, some sort of confession incriminating Anne was wrung out of the poor wretch, though exactly what he confessed is not on record. Later, when the affair was made public, the quidnucks of London could tell the most private details of his adultery with the Queen, for Cromwell took care that such gossip should be well circulated. Whatever confession was extorted from Smeaton, it implicated not only himself, but the various gentlemen who shared with him the Queen's smiles, and was quite sufficient for Cromwell's purpose. Hurrying the unfortunate musician to the tower in the strictest secrecy, Cromwell sent his nephew, Richard, post-haste, to Greenwich, with a letter divulging Smeaton's story to the king. 
Richard Cromwell arrived at the tilt yard as the tournament was in progress, the king and Anne witnessing the bouts from a glazed gallery. Several versions of what then happened are given, but the most probable is that as soon as Henry had glanced at the contents of the letter and knew that Cromwell had succeeded, he abruptly rose and left the sports, starting almost immediately afterwards for London without the knowledge of Anne. With him went a great favorite of his, Sir Henry Norris, keeper of the privy purse, who was engaged to be married to Madge Shelton, Anne's cousin, who had at one time been put forward by the Bolin interests as the king's mistress. Norris had, no doubt, flirted platonically with the queen, who had openly bidden for his admiration, but there is not an atom of evidence that their connection was a guilty one. On the way to London, the king taxed him with undue familiarity with Anne. Horror-stricken, Norris could only protest his innocence, and resist all the temptations held out to him to make a clean breast of the queen's immorality. One of the party of Anne's enemies, Sir William Fitzwilliam, was also in attendance on the king, and to him was given the order to convey Norris to the tower. After the king's departure from Greenwich, Anne learnt that he had gone without a word of farewell, and that Smeaton was absent from the joust, detained in London. The poor woman's heart must have sunk with fear, for the portents of her doom were all around her. She could not cry for mercy to the flabby coward her husband, who, as usual, slunk from bearing the responsibility of his own acts, and ran away from the danger of personal appeal from those whom he wronged. Late at night the dread news was whispered to her that Smeaton and Norris were both in the tower, and early in the morning she herself was summoned to appear before a quorum of the royal commissioners, presided over by her uncle and enemy, the Duke of Norfolk. She was rudely told that she was accused of committing adultery with Smeaton and Norris, both of whom had confessed. She cried and protested in vain that it was untrue. She was told to hold her peace, and was placed under arrest until her barge was ready and the tide served to bear her upstream to the tower. With her went a large guard of halberdiers and the Duke of Norfolk. Thinking that she was being carried to her husband at Westminster, she was composed and tranquil on the way but when she found that the traitor's gate of the tower was her destination, her presence of mind deserted her. Sir William Kingston, one of the chief conspirators in Mary's favor, and governor of the fortress, stood upon the steps under the gloomy archway to receive her, and in sign of custody took her by the arm as she ascended. Quote, I was received with greater ceremony the last time I entered here, end quote. she cried indignantly. And as the heavy gates clanged behind her, and the portcullis dropped, she fell upon her knees and burst into a storm of hysterical tears. Kingston and his wife did their best to tranquilize her, but her passionate protestations of innocence made no impression upon them. Her brother, Lord Rockford, had, unknown to her, been a few hours before lodged in the same fortress, on the hideous and utterly unsupported charge of incest with his sister, and Cromwell's dragnet was cast awide to bring in all those whose names were connected, however loosely, with that of the Queen by her servants, all of whom were tumbling over each other in their haste to denounce their fallen mistress. Sir Thomas Weston and William Brereton, with both of whom Anne had been fond of bandying questionable compliments, were arrested on the 4th May, and on the 5th Sir Thomas Wyatt, the poet, and a great friend of the king, was put under guard on similar accusations. 
With regard to Wyatt, there seems to have been no doubt, as has been shown in an earlier chapter, that some love passages had passed between him and Anne before her marriage, and there is contemporary assertion to support the belief that their connection had not been an innocent one. But the case against him was finally dropped, and he was again taken into Henry's favor, a proof that there was no evidence of guilt on his part since Anne was queen. He is asserted to have begged Henry not to contract the marriage, and subsequently to have reminded him that he had done so, confessing after her arrest that Anne had been his mistress before she married the king. The wretched woman babbled hysterically without cessation in her chamber in the tower, all her distraught ravings being carefully noted and repeated by the ladies, mostly her personal enemies, who watched her night and day, artful leading questions being put to her to tempt her to talk the more. She was imprudent in her speech at the best of times, but now, in a condition of acute hysteria, she served the interests of her enemies to the full, dragging into her discourse the names of the gentlemen who were accused and repeating their risky conversations with her, which were now twisted to their worst meaning. At one time she would only desire death. Then she would make merry with a good dinner or supper, chatting and jesting, only to break down into hysterical laughter and tears in the midst of her merriment. Anon she would affect to believe that her husband was but trying her constancy, and pleaded with all her heart to be allowed to see him again. But he, once having broken the shackles, was gaily amusing himself in gallant guise with Mistress Seymour, who was lodged, for appearance sake, in the house of her mentor, Sir Nicholas Carew, a few miles from London, but within easy reach of a horseman. Anne, in her sober moments, must have known that she was doomed. She hoped much from Cranmer, almost the only friend of hers now not in prison. But Cranmer, however strong in counsel, was a weak reed in combat, and hastened to save himself at the cost of the woman upon whose shoulders he had climbed to greatness. The day after Anne's arrest, Cranmer wrote to the king, quote, a letter of consolation, yet wisely making no apology for her, but acknowledging how divers of the lords had told him of certain of her faults, which, he said, he was sorry to hear, and concluded, desiring that the king would continue his love to the gospel, lest it should be thought that it was for her sake only that he had favored it. End quote. Before he had time to despatch the letter, the timorous archbishop was summoned across the river to Westminster to answer certain disquieting questions of the commissioners, who informed him of the evidence against the queen, and in growing alarm for himself and his cause, he hurried back to Lambeth without uttering a word in favor of the accused whose guilt he accepted without question. Thenceforward, Anne's enemies worked their way unchecked, even her father being silenced by fear for himself. For Cromwell's safety, it was necessary that none of the accused should escape, who later might do him injury, and now that he and his imperialistic policy had been buttressed by the discovery of Anne's infidelity, not even the nobles of the French faction dared to oppose it by seeming to side with the unhappy woman. The secretary did his work thoroughly. The indictments were laid before the grand juries of Middlesex and Kent, as the offenses were asserted to have been committed over a long period, both at Greenwich and Whitehall, or Hampton Court. To the charges against Anne, of adultery with Smeaton, who it was asserted had confessed, Norreys, Weston, Brereton, and Lord Rockford, was added that, 
of having conspired with them to kill the king there was not an atom of evidence worth the name to support any of the charges except the doubtful confession of smeaton wrung from him by torture and it is certain that at the period in question the death of henry would have been fatal to the interests of anne but a state prosecution in the then condition of the law almost invariably meant a condemnation of the accused and when smeaton weston norries and brereton were arraigned in westminster hall on the twelfth may their doom was practically sealed before the trial smeaton simply pleaded guilty of adultery only and prayed for mercy the rest of the accused strenuously denied their guilt on the whole of the charges but all were condemned to the terrible death awarded to traitors though on what detailed evidence if any does not now appear every effort was made to tempt norries to confess but he replied that he would rather die a thousand deaths than confess a lie for he verily believed the queen innocent in the meanwhile anne in the tower continued her strange behavior at times arrogantly claiming all her royal prerogatives at times reduced to hysterical self-abasement and despair on the fifteenth may she and her brother were brought to the great hall of the tower before a large panel of peers under the presidency of the duke of norfolk all that could add ignominy to the accused was done the lieges were crowded into the space behind barriers at the end of the hall the city fathers under the lord mayor were bidden to attend and with bated breath the subjects saw the woman they had always scorned publicly branded as an incestuous adulteress the charges as usual at the time were made in a way and upon grounds that now would not be permitted in any court of justice scraps of overheard conversation with norries and others were twisted into sinister significance allegations unsupported and not included in the indictment were dragged in to prejudice the accused and loose statements incapable of proof or disproof were liberally introduced for the same purpose the charge of incest with rockford depended entirely upon the assertion that he once remained in his sister's room a long time and in his case also loose gossip was alleged as a proof of crime that anne had said that the king was impotent that rockford had thrown doubts upon the king being the father of anne's child and similar hearsay ribaldry both anne and her brother defended themselves unaided with ability and dignity they pointed out the absence of evidence against them and the inherent improbability of the charges but it was of no avail for her death had already been settled between henry and cromwell and the duke of norfolk with his sinister squint condemned his niece anne queen of england to be burnt or beheaded at the king's pleasure and viscount rockford to a similar death both denied their guilt after sentence but acknowledged as was the custom of the time that they deserved death this being the only way in which mercy might be gained so far as forfeiture of property was concerned anne had been cordially hated by the people her rise had meant the destruction of the ancient religious foundations the shaking of the ecclesiastical basis of english society but the sense of justice was not dead and the procedure at the trial shocked the public conscience already men and women murmured that the king's goings-on with mistress seymour whilst his wife was under trial for adultery were a scandal and anne in her death had more friends than in her life 
on all sides in london now from the lord mayor downwards it was said that anne had been condemned not because she was guilty but because the king was tired of her at all events wrote chaphus to grenville there was surely never a man who wore the horns so gaily as he on the seventeenth may the five condemned men were led to their death upon tower hill all of them including smeaton being beheaded as usual in such cases they acknowledged general guilt but not one except perhaps smeaton admitted the particular crimes for which they died for their kin might have suffered in property if not in person if the king's justice had been too strongly impugned anne in alternate hope and despair still remained in the tower but mostly longing for the rapid death she felt in her heart must come little she knew however why her sacrifice was deferred yet from day to day in one of her excited nervous outbursts she had cried that no matter what they did no one could prevent her from dying queen of england she had reckoned without henry's meanness cromwell's cunning and cranmer's suppleness her death warrant had been signed by the king on the sixteenth may and cranmer was sent to receive her last confession the coming of the archbishop her archbishop as she called him gave her fresh hope she was not to be killed after all but to be banished and cranmer was to bring her the good news alas poor soul she little knew her cranmer even yet he had been primed by cromwell for a very different purpose that of worming out of anne some admission that would give him a pretext for pronouncing her marriage with the king invalid from the first the task was a repulsive one for the primate whose act alone had made the marriage possible but cranmer was cranmer the position was a complicated one henry as he invariably did wished to save his face and seem in the right before the world consequently he could not confess that he had been mistaken in the divorce from catherine and get rid of anne's marriage in that way nor did he wish to restore mary to the position of heiress to the crown what he needed cranmer's help for was to render elizabeth also illegitimate but still his daughter in order that any child he might have by jane seymour or failing that his natural son the duke of richmond might be acknowledged his successor at intervals during anne's career her alleged betrothal to the earl of northumberland before her marriage had been brought up to her detriment and the poor hare-brained earl had forsworn himself more than once on the subject he was dying now but he was again pressed to say that a regular betrothal had taken place with anne but he was past earthly fear and finally asserted that no contract had been made foiled in this attempt henry or rather cromwell sent cranmer to the tower on the sixteenth may on his shameful errand to lure the poor woman by hopes of pardon to confess the existence of an impediment to her marriage with the king what the impediment was was never made public but anne's latest biographer mr friedman adduces excellent reasons for arriving at the conclusions that i have drawn namely that mary bolin having been henry's mistress he and anne were within the prohibited degrees of affinity for husband and wife the fact that no marriage had taken place between henry and mary bolin being regarded as canonically immaterial in any case the admission of a known impediment having been made by anne no time was lost the next day the seventeenth may cranmer sat with cromwell and other members of the council in his primate's court at lambeth to condemn the marriage that he himself had made anne was formally represented but nothing was said on her behalf 
and sentence was hurriedly pronounced that the king's marriage with Anne Boleyn had never been a marriage at all. At the same time, order was sent to Sir William Kingston that the concubine was to suffer the last penalty on the following morning. When the sleepless night for Anne had passed, mostly in prayer, she took the sacrament with the utmost devotion, and in that most solemn moment swore before the host, on her hopes of eternal life, that she had never misused her body to the king's dishonor. In the meanwhile, her execution had been deferred until the next day, and Anne again lost her nerve. It was cruel, she said, to keep her so long in suspense. Pray, she petitioned, put her out of her misery now that she was prepared. The operation would not be painful, Kingston assured her. Quote, My neck is small enough, end quote, she said, spanning it with her fingers and again burst into hysterics. Soon she became calm once more, and thenceforward only yearned for despatch. Quote, no one ever had a better will for death than she, end quote, wrote Chapus to his master, and Kingston, hardened as he was to the sight of the condemned in their last hours, expressed surprise to Cromwell that instead of sorrow, quote, this lady has much joy and pleasure in death. End quote. Remorse for her ungenerous treatment of the Princess Mary principally troubled her. She herself, she said, was not going to execution by the divine judgment for what she had been accused of, but for having planned the death of the princess. And so, in alternate prayer and light chatter, passed Anne's last night on earth, and at nine o'clock on the spring morning of the 19th May, she was led forth to the courtyard within the tower, where a group of gentlemen, including Cromwell and the Dukes of Richmond and Suffolk, stood on or close to a low scaffold or staging reached by four steps from the ground. Anne was dressed in gray damask, trimmed with fur, over a crimson petticoat, and cut low at the neck, so as to offer no impediment to the executioner's steel, and for the same reason the brown hair was dressed high in a net under the pearl-bordered coif. Kept back by guards to some little distance from the platform, stood a large crowd of spectators, who had flocked in at the heels of the Lord Mayor and Sheriffs, though foreigners had been rigidly excluded. When Anne had ascended the steps, she received permission to say a few words, and followed the tradition of not complaining against the king's justice which had condemned her. She had not come thither to preach, she said, but to die, though she was not guilty of the particular crimes for which she had been condemned. When, however, she began to speak of Jane Seymour being the cause of her fall, those on the scaffold stopped her, and she said no more. A headsman of St. Omer had been brought over from Calais, in order that the broadsword, instead of the axe, might be used, and this man, who was undistinguishable by his garb from the other bystanders, now came forward, and, kneeling, asked the doomed woman's pardon, which granted, and herself knelt in a distraught way, as if to pray, but really gazed around her in mute appeal from one pitiless face to another. The headsman, taking compassion upon her, assured her that he would not strike until she gave the signal. "'You will have to take this quaff off,' said the poor woman and one of the ladies who attended her did so, and partially bound her eyes with a handkerchief. But Anne still imagined that her headdress was in the way, and kept her hand upon her hair, straining her eyes and ears towards the steps, where, from the headsman's words, she expected the sword to be handed to him. Whilst she was thus kneeling erect in suspense, the sword, 
which was hidden in the straw behind her, was deftly seized by the French executioner, who, swinging the heavy blade around, in an instant cut through the erect slender neck, and the head of Anne Boleyn jerked from the shoulders and rolled upon the cloth that covered the platform. Catherine, in her neglected tomb at Peterborough, was avenged, but the fissure that had been opened up between England and the papacy for the sake of this woman had widened now past bridging. Politicians might, and did, make up their differences now that the concubine was dead, and form alliances regardless of religious affinities, but submission to the papacy in future might mean that the most powerful people in England would be deprived of the fat spoils of the church with which Cromwell had bought them, and that the vainest king on earth must humbly confess himself in the wrong. Anne herself was a mere straw upon a whirlpool, though her abilities, as Cromwell confessed, were not to be despised. She did not plan or make the Reformation, though she was forced by her circumstances to patronize it. The real author of the Great Schism of England was not Anne or Cranmer, but Luther's enemy, Charles V, the champion of Catholicism. But for the pressure he put upon the Pope to refuse Henry's divorce, in order to prevent a coalition of England and France, Cranmer's defiance of the papacy would not have been needed, and Henry might have come back to Rome again easily. But with Cranmer, to provide him with plausible pretexts for the repeated indulgence of his self-will, and Cromwell, to feed his pride and cupidity by the plunder of the church, Henry had already been drawn too far to go back. Greed and vanity of the ruling powers thus conspired to make permanent in England the influence of Evanescent and Boleyn.